in the month of May, um, very much thinking of our Blessed Mother. And I think for any iconographer, Mary is the one who first saw Christ, the icon of the Father. So in terms of the revolution in Christian spirituality, uh, Mary is, is the first one to, to do that because as Christ was born and she looked on his face, so she is looking on he who is the icon of the Father. So in our life as iconographers, our vocation as iconographers, I think developing a, a love for the Virgin Mary and an intimacy with her and a trust to her maternal protection and guidance is, is a really, really important thing. So in this month of May, which is dedicated to Our Lady traditionally, um, I would really encourage you to, to put your iconography under her protection to ask her to put her mantle around you, around the place where you pray, to put it around your hands, and to, to enable you to really pray with your eyes, to enable your eyes to be a place of communion between you and her son, and through her son with our Heavenly Father. And Mary, full of grace, the, the vessel of the Holy Spirit, shows us the way in which we as, as physical beings can receive grace to manifest something in materiality. Her, her vocation was to give her matter as the vehicle of salvation. Salvation wasn't about some airy fairy spiritual thing. It needed flesh and blood to become part of the fallen world. It's interesting, the book of Revelation, it says that after the great war in heaven, Satan was thrown down to earth. In other words, to the cosmos, to the material realm, cast out of heaven. And so our materiality is the place where that battle between heaven and earth continues to be worked out. So Christ coming in the flesh, as the fathers used to say, it's almost like he, he became a hidden poison which the devil ate through his, his, his lust for, for, to devour. He, he, he sort of buries himself into matter so that Satan consumes it and therewith brings about his own fall that hell is broken the, the the gates of hell are broken and grace enters into into the fallen world so christ becomes flesh so that we can enter into our spiritual destiny enter into heaven into the unity between heaven and earth and mary is the place where that happens and we as iconographers in our very, very little humble ways, are continuing that. She, in a way, is the, the first iconographer because she is the one whose flesh was taken and was woven into, into the gospel. So in this month of May, let's put ourselves as iconographers into Mary's care, under her mantle, ask for her guidance, as we say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers and Mothers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so second part of hands. If you remember last week, we looked at how a hand, if I put that in front of the camera, there we are, basically two squares, created an oblong, curved line in the middle, thumb coming off from here and usually with a slight gap here creating a certain elegance. So let's start by looking at some example of hands and see how with that basic construction they become terribly eloquent. If any of you have got Italian relatives 
um, or, or Italian French, you know, that when the Italians speak, there's lots of hands everywhere. Blah, 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 blah. It, it's like another language. It's an extra voice. Um, and it's exactly the same way in the icon. The icons are the things that speak. Now, if you notice in icons, mouths are always sight closed because in the presence of God, we remain silent. But the organs of reception, the ears, the nose, the eyes are more pronounced and very important. But the mouth is always closed. Always closed because we are silent. What, what can we speak? What can we say in the presence of God? It's God who speaks, we who receive. However, we know that there is conversation and dialogue and so forth. Um, and that's really re restricted to the hands. So we're going to have a little look at a few icon examples and see how that works. And then I'm going to demonstrate how to draw the classic um, posture of the hands, the, the blessing. You remember... And you, those of you who are Orthodox, um, have been to the Orthodox liturgy, the, the priest always blesses you with his hands in that position. And when you're doing icons of Christ, this is almost always the, the hand you've got to draw. So last week we looked at that pointing hand from back and from the front. Today I'm going to demonstrate the, the blessing hand and how that can be done in a couple of ways. And then next week, I'm going to look at hands holding things and how you construct that. So that's, that's, that's the next, that's the program for today and for next week. So let me share the screen over onto my iPad. There we go. Now you might remember last week, we had um, the demonstration of the construction of the hand with the uh, flesh built around the bones. So just remind yourself of that to start with, because if we're going to bend the hand to make gestures, it's going to be those joints that are going to be bending. So to do it convincingly, you're going to have to construct it from the inside out, just like we did with that first dry diagram. We're going to be building it up from the inside out. So just remind yourself those, those bones inside the finger, the radiant shape of the bones on the palm, and how that relates to the wrist. Okay. So let's have a look at some hands. Now, this is that classic one. Those of you who did the garment course with me, you remember, you'll remember, recognize this figure. Now looking at the hand, now, can you see how the hand here is very much an extension of the arm? Hands aren't just sort of stuck without relating to the rest of the body. So you can see here there's a sweep from the shoulder through the, the joint of the elbow and then flowing through the hand here. And interestingly, if you notice the in the hand, so it's not at this rate magnification, it's a bit blurry, but can you see the ring finger is bent, which creates a negative space here. So when you're looking at how the hand works, we're not just looking at individual fingers or an individual hand. We're putting it in context, one of the arm and the rest of the body. And also how it creates negative space. And in this particular example, just, uh, 
take that off for a minute. Trying to. Um, this is annoying. Trying to get it to. Why is this not? I'm trying to shrink it down again, but it's not going to do it. But in this particular one, can you see that that the flow through the arm goes through the gap in the hand? So you see where that we look at the construct of the arm it's like an arrow shape and if you carried that on it's going right through that gap so it's a very very sophisticated very clever little device of the 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 artist that just actually created a hand that's actually really energetic and dynamic by creating a space between the fingers. So the hand itself is gesturing and then opening up. And by opening up like that, it's then focusing you on the hand and then onto the Virgin Mary. At the, this is at the Annunciation. So here the angel is announcing to the Virgin Mary that she's to receive um, the word become flesh within her womb, receive the Holy Spirit that's going to overshadow her. And that sense of connection is actually coming through the hand. So it's as though the arm is converging at this point, And the message is radiating out from that point. Really powerful visual stuff going on here. Really quite sophisticated. So there's a lot more to a hand than might meet the eye. So, but at the, then if we look more closely at the hand, you can see how it creates that shape as a sort of wedge from the wrist to the um, knuckles. And then we've got those two fingers you carry the line on, making an arrow. And arrow shapes are very, very important. We saw that in the garment course, um, and we can see it again here in the hands, how arrows take you on a journey. They point you somewhere. They take your eye to the next place. So in this particular one, it's sort of eye is being taken down the arm, and then it's taken into two directions here. It's taken up to here and along to there. But even as it comes up to there, it's being taken over there as well. And that negative space itself is working to take your eye to, to, to the subject of the encounter, which is the Virgin Mary. Okay. If we look a little bit closer now at the, the, the hand, can you see that there's actually between the fingers here, there's a little gap which opens up like that. So we've got this, and then there's another little gap here. And then there's this bigger gap here. So we've got sort of three bits of negative space going on here. We've got between the first finger and the middle finger, between the middle finger and the ring finger, and between the middle finger and the uh, middle finger and the little finger. And all of that is just as important to the as it were the eloquence with which the hand is speaking. It's not just sort of four digits stuck on and randomly working. They are working together in a very, very sophisticated way. And so the arm comes down like this in that arrow shape, opens up, 
to that really quite dramatic angle on the top of the um, hand there. Ready then for the fingers to take you, see one, two, and that opening up it, it, instead of stopping with the hand, it's then taking you through the hand on, it's almost like it's sort of shooting words across the image. It's coming from the, 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 the archangel down through the hand, almost like electricity, and then shooting off across to the other side. And that's all being done through this visual construct. So now you see, if you sort of give it that sort of white outline, you can see how it's almost like rays that are then coming out. Like that, all sort of towards the Virgin Mary, okay? So let's have a no look at another um, image. Okay, this is... Uh, a modern image. This is by Father Zenon. And it's a rather nice example of how hands are doing lots of different things all at once. So here we've not got such a dramatic gesture. And that makes it instead of a, a sort of really sort of powerful announcement, in this particular image of the Annunciation, you've got a much more gentle, contemplative, meeting between the, the handmaid of the Lord, the woman who loves God, who's spent her life in the temple, humbly waiting for the Lord to ask. And here the angel comes with tremendous respect and gracing the Virgin Mary. God comes with infinite respect for our humanity. He doesn't demand or impose, he invites. And here, you get this sort of very gentle gesture with the hand. So it's sort of coming down and coming up from the hand. So it's sort of got a sweeping gesture. And then it's coming up and then the fingers are taking it over in that sort of direction like that. So it's like a flow coming from the top and down and then up. And that, rather than the sort of an electricity that's got that sort of power in it that we saw in the first one, here, like water. So it's more like water than electricity if we use those two forms of energy. And so this is sort of coming from the angel and washing over her. So we think of a fountain of grace. And then one of the images Two sorts of images for the Holy Spirit. One is fire. So you think like a blowtorch, you know, which was that first one. But the other one is water. Think of baptism. And here we have a, a sort of flow of grace. It's a gentle caressing that is coming to the Virgin Mary. And it's for her to respond. And so the way that this is then created, if you look at the Virgin Mary's hand here, it's like, oh, okay. And you see this gesture in a lot of icons, in a lot of the, a lot of the ascetic saints will stand with their hand like this. Um, and it, it's almost a, a sort of command to stop, to rest, to pause to take a moment to contemplate and to behold, to look, to pray, to meet. Things in one sense are not as they seem. There is a deeper mystery here. So here Mary is sort of turning towards us and you get a feeling that she's stopping and pausing to reflect. And when you read the narrative of the Annunciation, that's what she does. She says, um, but this can't be. How can this happen? Basically, who really are you? What's really going on? 
you know, I'm, I'm all up for saying yes to God, but I've got to really know what you're, you're saying here. It's a contemplative gesture. It's a, a wait, contemplate, look, encounter. And that slight turn of the hand, it's not like that sort of go away. It's a stop and enter. So it's that slight twist of the hand. You see my hand in, in the camera. It's coming just like that. And you see how the, the fingers, instead of like that, become like that. You, so you're getting a little bit of overlap. So you, if you look at the little finger here, you can see that slightly in front of the other fingers. So there's a slight turn in that gesture. But again, look at the negative space. Look at where that hand's positioned. You've got that V shape. And if you take that V shape up, comes to the end of her face there, and this goes along the edge of her garment. In other words, it's a frame or a stand that her face is placed on. So this actually, the way it's constructed, takes you to the face of the Virgin. So that um, on this visual journey, the, the hand is holding you up visually so you engage with the face. And if you look in this icon, she is looking towards you. Okay. So the Virgin Mary is looking at you and that hand is holding her gaze and holding your gaze. So you might think, oh, well, hands are just communicating things, but actually within the composition of an icon, they, they are absolutely crucial. And you might not even realize what's happening to you visually, but when you're drawing this yourself, you really need to understand how the hands work within the context. And if you begin to at least ask those questions, when you're drawing them, they will at least, you're doing it with some understanding and therefore they're more likely to work accurately. So for example, you might try and copy this particular enunciation. Oh, the hands are down there, sort of across her chest. So as long as I get them vaguely there, then that's okay. But actually, you get them, if you moved it across, you know, a millimeter, it wouldn't be relating to the head in the same way. And likewise, if you get the angle a little bit wrong or a little altered, that V shape between the fingers and the thumb isn't going to relate to that gaze in the same way. So these are little things which as you progress on your journey as an iconographer, you, you can begin to get on the inside of and, and savor them and feel them and then try to reproduce the, the way that they're working. And that will create icons that really communicate rather than just becoming a sort of jelly of hands and arms and faces and garments. They're all sort of floating a little bit. Icons which really are much more convincing have this very tight, strong logic to them, and therefore they speak really eloquently. Okay. So let's have a look at another one now. Um, so let me take, yes, and this one. Okay. So here we've got a, a, an evangelist and two very interesting hands, or certainly one incredibly interesting hand. The, the one at the bottom is um, holding, let me get this to right, right. is holding the book. Okay, so that's, that's fairly obvious. But even the way he's holding it is important. If you actually look at the book, you see there's a, a V shape. Take that V shape and it takes you to the head. 
and it goes through that shoulder. There's an, it takes you through the shoulder and you've got that sort of angle of the nose. And then there's that angle going across it slightly. But again, the, the hand is sort of holding the book, which acts as a rest, which stops your eye just sort of sinking off the page and takes you um, to the um, back up to the face. Yes, time is nearly up. We've got about uh, five seconds. I'll just restart the program exactly the same as I did last week. You log immediately back in and then we'll continue. Okay. So what I want to show you now is um, how to create a gesture with the hand. So it's not just that simple, simple thing. And if I go to, here we are. So, you can see here, I've already started by mapping out the, the usual grid. So just like we started last time, you've got the, the two squares, the middle line um, and the lines where the joints are coming. Okay. On the left hand side here, there's this mosaic. It's fairly um, simply drawn. It's not a um, one of those really, really ex ex exquisite um, and uh, very fine mosaics. This is a fairly um, it's beautifully done, but it, it's not so complex. So the hand here, um, this is the hand which, which you, if you've been to the Orthodox liturgy, you'll, you'll see the priest will hold his hand like this, which is the uh, lettuce of the, the name of Jesus. So the I, so the eye on the little finger, and then as the ring finger and the thumb come together, so you've got the C, so Jesus, and then the C again, and then the two fingers up here crossing over like the uh, Chi, so the first letter of, of Christ's name. So Jesus Christos, the, the first and last letters of Jesus's name. So this is the, the hand of blessing. So when you see the hand like this in the Pantocrat or icon, that's Jesus blessing us. So there's your model on the left hand side. And I'm going to now draw this, which I hope will show you how you can take that basic map that we created last time and adapt it each time. So here goes. So if you notice the little finger, there's a little bit of a gap and it sort of goes out from the side a little bit before then sort of going up and, and coming across. So just sort of sketching that in. And then the ring finger is reaching over across. So I've, I've created the, the angle for that. Now trying to get this ring finger crossing a going across is really difficult. Um, if you're not careful, you end up, say like there, having a really, really thin middle section. So when you're doing it, be, be aware that that's what's going to really challenge you is to get that width right. Now, these two fingers are coming up sort of parallel to each other, but the middle finger is slightly on top of the index finger. So be careful when you put the, that top line where the nail would be, just have it slightly behind the front of the middle finger. All right. Now I've come back to that um, ring finger still trying to get that right and if you notice just here I've, I've moved the bottom line down a little bit and the top line and that will enable it to come across further because I need it to meet the thumb okay notice that I'm curving that inside putting that heavy line there 
And now I'm working back onto that little finger. And just having the, don't make them too straight. It, it, it looks a bit blocky and heavy. So by just having those slight movements, it breaks up the blockiness. Now I'm getting that sweep of the hand in there. The mound of the thumb, that's really important for getting that flow. So we've got curves coming up and get the top of the thumb big enough. Don't make that too small. Remember to curve in the side there so that sort of sweeps down this creates energy within the hand i'm just making that a little straighter got a putty rubber there and by the way i've been using i think a 4b pencil at this stage so i can really correct it without um, having to damage the paper so 4B, 3B pencils, ideal at this stage. And then once you've got it generally there, you might want to move to a, a 2B um, as you begin to refine it. Now that cushion on the, the bottom of the palm there, relating to the cushion beneath the thumb. Now I'm refining that little finger a bit. And if you notice the top was too thin in relationship to the rest of the finger. So I'm just broadening that ever so slightly at the top. And that looks like it belongs to that hand now. It's not so, so emasculated. Now back to this very tricky finger. Now notice I've widened the bottom line there and I've also moved the point where the joint is underneath which gives a thicker finger. So now I'm beginning to refine this I've moved over to a I think a 2H pencil now And I'm beginning to um, refine all the all those all those lines. And you notice by having the right um, width at each stage of the finger, how that's creating movement even with just a hand on its own. It's creating a grace and an elegance. And that creates a movement. Now notice the, the way in which the, the curve from the thumb sort of flows down and then is picked up by the cushion on the bottom of the palm. So the one is sort of feeding down to the other without joining up. There's a sort of one nestled into the other. Notice the fingernail is just a light line, partial line on the top of that finger. Now you might have thought, oh, that was finished ages ago, but this is, this is where you have to push yourself to, to keep asking yourself, what am I seeing? And therefore, what do I need to redraw to refine and refine and refine? So you see now there's just these little tweaks. What is improving is the, the harmony, the elegance and the movement. So if you're looking at something and your eye suddenly jars, 
then that's the play that's the moment and that's the place that you need to work on and um so it's, it's if you imagine you were blindfolded and when you were rubbing your hand over a surface you you suddenly just feel a little um little bump say you were planing wood or sanding wood you'd stop and then look to see exactly what it was so you might not have seen it with your naked eye but you feel that little little bump and then you use the sandpaper it's the same thing when you're trying to correct your work if you follow the eye through the composition and if it suddenly goes boom or it, it judders or it, it there's there's not a natural flow you're suddenly aware of it that's the point where you've got to work that's where you put your energy in a lot of times people feel oh it's not quite right but we can't pin down exactly where it it's going wrong so we end up changing and moving everything and it just makes it into one big mess if you're not careful if you can go on a journey with your eye and become sensitive to when it just sort of doesn't quite go right that will give you a good clue as to what area you should be working on and you could see in that example the way in which those fingers were beginning to nestle together the way in which the thumb and the first finger were just sort of relating to each other and the way in which the the little finger was sort of gracefully framing the the rest of the hand so you can go on a couple of journeys two or three journeys visually in that hand um, and allow your your eyes to tell you where maybe it, it's jarring so like i was getting working on that that thing the the in the ring finger coming across trying to get that width right and then in in relationship to the thumb so that I had to keep moving it around. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, that is how you will push yourself to produce really good work. And if you find yourself getting stuck, leave it and come back to it when you're feeling fresher and your eyes are fresher. It's usually about your eyes being fresh because, you know, if you've been hammering away at something for an hour and, you, you know, you can't see the wood for the trees. So just leave it or take a photograph. If you take a photograph on your mobile phone and you look at it on that again your eye will see it fresh and spot the point where it just jolts it and that that will begin to unwrap for you the, the areas you've got to work on all right everybody well that brings uh, this afternoon session to a close lovely to have you all with me um, and um, we'll have the final session next week same time and the video compilation will be up probably by Monday, okay? I get, I get into moods with the software and it drives me nuts sometimes, so it just depends how it works, all right? Brilliant. Thanks, Gail. God bless everybody. See you next week.